So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a new model for technology innovation and collaboration, but I'm going to try to weave together all the themes that you heard about in the last talk and from this morning. So uh, as you heard, I'm the founding director of the, uh, the Wies Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering. We're in the process of self-assembling. Uh, we started only 20 months ago. We're, we went from zero to 160 full-time staff in 20 months, plus I've given out 600 IDs on the floor. It's quite an interesting venture. It started about um, four years ago when I was asked with another faculty member to envision the future of bioengineering across all of Harvard and its affiliated hospitals. And we basically looked back and um, found that bioengineering in the past was basically taking engineering principles and trying to solve medical problems. But when we looked around us, we realized that there's an incredibly exciting thing going on that many of you may not be aware of, which is essentially the convergence of the life sciences with engineering and the physical sciences. We could literally manipulate an atom, a gene, a molecule, a cell, one at a time. And as a result, the boundaries between living and non-living systems are literally beginning to break down. And we felt that we're beginning to uncover nature's design principles and that now the future will be actually looking to biology to develop new engineering solutions. And that's what we call biologically inspired engineering. Now we got a, a, a philanthropist involved, Hans-Jörg Wies, early in the process and he brought his own two cents to this. He basically said he was very excited about this. He was a Harvard Business School graduate and an undergrad from Switzerland in, in mechanical engineering years ago, but he said, he said, I know big companies. They're fantastic at product development, but they can't innovate. They, it's like turning a tanker. I know academia. It's fantastic at inventing and innovating, but it only makes widgets. It never really has impact on the real world. And so what he wanted was an, a huge startup in the midst of the world's greatest academic environment. The other thing he said is that this has to be high risk. I don't want to see the next best hip implant. He said, if you don't fail at a lot of what you set out to do, I will view the whole institute as a failure. And that, in and of itself, more than any dollars he gave, which was the single largest gift in Harvard's history of a $125 million kickoff gift, it wasn't the money, but what attracted the best and the brightest and the most entrepreneurial sciences was the ability to do high-risk work. So very simply, our mission is to transform healthcare industry and the environment by emulating the way nature builds. Two goals, to discover and apply the principles that nature uses to build living things, and then to leverage that knowledge to engineer biologically inspired and devices to revolutionize healthcare and enhance sustainability. So we were launched, as I said, Biggest Gift 20 months ago, high-risk research, span academia and industry, and, and do technology development and translation. We pulled together 16 of the best faculty to a common site from not only all of Harvard and its hospitals, but also Boston University, UMass Worcester, to try to leverage the entire Boston Cambridge region. And we didn't give people laboratories. We developed what we call collaboratories. A few of my people collaborate actually with Jim Collins, who you just heard about in one room, and a few with George Church, who you just heard about in another on the same floor around projects. We then recruited people with 10 to 20 years of industrial experience in everything from pharmaceuticals to aerospace to manufacturing. And they bring product development and team management experience. And you put them together with students, fellows, and creative faculty, and you begin to get something really interesting. And I mentioned this is an alliance between many institutions. To get to this morning's talks about uh, philanthropy, you need to have milestones for success. Our first two are the usual for academia, great people, great research, but the three in yellow are most important. We're going to be measured in five years on the intellectual property portfolio we produce. Corporate alliances, licensing agreements, and new startups that emerge out of this, and having technologies in the product pipeline. We can't control their success, but if we can get them in the pipeline, that is a major change compared to what academia usually does. Now, rather than give out money, which is the way everybody does things, little grants, I live off of those for 26 years. I said, we're not doing that, because what happens is people fight to get the grant, they get the grant, and they, they just move away. So what we did is we funded enabling technology platforms, which are basically we call cores that generate other cores. These are faculty, staff, collaborators, clinicians, industrial partners that develop new technological capabilities that will enable a, a new wave of materials and devices. And our areas are huge. They range from healthcare, manufacturing, and robotics to energy and sustainable architecture. It sounds crazy, but the most exciting things going on right now is the weave back and forth of having people on the same floor and you know, needing an instrument and you're doing a diagnostic device, but you want something to control a microscope camera, and that comes from the robotics platform. 
So I'm going to give you an example of what we do by these platforms. The first is called anticipatory medical devices, and the idea is to develop portable wireless devices that sense life-threatening medical events before they happen and transmit signals that reboot disease. We view this as the future of autonomous home health care. So you saw that woman in the, in the movie, help, I've fallen and I can't get up. Well, this is help, I've fallen and I can't get up. I'm okay, because it has a therapeutic integrated. So, the vision is iPhone that can sense multiple dynamic physiological rhythms for all the reasons that Jad told you. There's enormous richness in the dynamics of rhythms. If, yet we go to, medicine is static now. You go to your doctor once a year and you get average heart rate, average breathing rate, average blood pressure. It's totally meaningless. Okay, so there's, there's richness in those signals. Some of our faculty have de developed algorithms that can predict things like early Preliminary data, they could predict seizures minutes before they happen by changes in dynamics. So we would have on-the-fly software to predict before something happens, remote sensing, and then we'd have an actuator that would reboot. And the first example is stochastic resonance, that crayfish mechanism. Jim Collins pioneered this in academic labs, but in an academic lab, it never really got to patients. This has been done for many, many years. So we are actually now at the point where we've made shoe insoles that a shoe insole manufacturer is making for us that have actuators that vibrate randomly. And we believe, based on 200 humans with bigger devices, that they should restore the balance of 20-year-olds to 85-year-olds. David Paterfar is at UMass Worcester Medical School. He took the same concept. He put it in a bassinet mattress in the neonatal intensive care unit, and he published with 15 patients this spring that all of them have decreased incidence of apnea of prematurity. That's when babies stop breathing. Because their, their, their breathing rhythms are not yet developed, and this increases the sensitivity of the system. Now, you can envision parents go home with those babies that survive, and they stay up all night staring, calling the doctor. I think they stopped breathing. Well, if we can miniaturize that and put it on the back, now we've got something. If we now miniaturize it, we're on our path to here when we integrate all these. So 30-year vision, but along the path we see technology fallout. Another platform, I had biomimetic microsystems to engineer microchips that contain living cells that reconstitute human organ level functions for drug screening, diagnostic, and therapeutic applications. Big goal, accelerate drug development and replace animal testing. One of the biggest costs in time sinks, and the animal results often don't predict what happens in humans. Biggest problem for pharmaceutical. Well, I've been involved with George Whitesides for many years in taking the robust manufacturing techniques that come from microchip industry and applying them to control cell behavior. And just one simple example, we have developed what we call a human breathing lung on a chip. It was published in Science a couple of months ago. And just very quickly, the major part of the lung function is, uh, is breathing as the alveolus, the air sac. And the air sac basically is where air exchange occurs, anesthetics, aerosol-based drug delivery, metastasis, inflammation you know, toxicant absorption. And if you go to higher magnification, the side of the air sac is actually one lining cell of the lung, a flexible porous matrix, and then one capillary blood vessel cell, and these are red blood cells, very, very big. But the interesting thing is that the whole thing is mechanically active. It actually breathes and stretches and blood is flowing by. So we've used microengineering to recapitulate this by making what are called microfluidics. You make systems that have little channels. We have a membrane, oh, I'm sorry. Doing things I didn't know I could do on here. Um, there are, in the middle, there's a membrane that's porous and flexible. We have human airway cells on one side, human capillary blood vessel cells on the other. We have medium with human blood cells floating by, and we have air on the other side. And then there, we have a little trick. We have little vacuum chambers that the same way the, vac the negative pressure in your, in your thorax makes you breathe when your, ri your ribs bow out, this thing stretches and relaxes, stretches and relaxes, the same degree of stretch that we see in our bodies. And the whole thing is optically clear, and it looks like a little rubber eraser between your fingers there. Now, what's amazing is if you put bacteria, like an infection or the proteins they release on the airway side, and you take human cells, like the postdoc took his own cells, made them white, fluorescent, injected them in the blood side, before the bacteria are there, they just flow by, which is exactly what happens when you're healthy in your blood. But if you give a bacterium on the other side, the cells immediately stick, which is exactly what happens if you smoke cigarettes and you have inflamed vessels or you have an injury. Now, if you, because we could see this, it's crystal clear, we can go to high magnification at the bottom left. Those pentagons are now individual holes we've engineered through the membrane. 
and you're going to see a white blood cell stick. It moves around, it looks for a space between two capillary cells, it squishes through, goes under, and then like a hole in one, it wiggles its rear end through the other side. On the other side, we could watch in real time, and now the colors have changed, the white blood cells are red, and the little green are living bacteria, and you see the white blood cells engulf. So you've just watched entire human inflammatory response in real time, all with human cells on this little chip. I don't have time to tell you, but this also predicted results with uh, nanoparticles from air that are known to be toxic. And it actually found, we discovered that the, the device predicted that breathing increases absorption of nanoparticles, which is, helps explain why we get things in our body that are nanoparticle size that should not get in. And we went to animals, and it was true. That's why it's in science, because this little chip predicted results already in animals. So just give you a, a high-level overview. Another platform is called Programmable Nanomaterials. The idea is to create smart nanotechnologies for regenerative medicine and drug delivery applications. So the idea is of injectable medical devices rather than implantables. So think of, you hear about stem cells. They're incredibly powerful, exciting. But why do we take them out of the body, grow them up, make them try to do what we want and put them back in. Why not inject something that targets to the injury site, self-assembles like our bodies do things, builds a scaffold that recruits the stem cells and then tells them what, it, what they want to do to regenerate. So these are, we have major projects in this area. Some of them are in regeneration. Some of them are cancer vaccines or uh, materials that mimic the embryonic tissue's ability to induce cancer cells to stop growing and differentiate or normalize. And we have some interesting results in this area, because embryonic tissues have that capability. Even with all the gene mutations, they stop growing and differentiate. It's known for 30 years. No one's followed it up. So what do I mean by programmable materials? Well, one example comes out of work of William Shi and, and Peng Yin in our group. And it's called DNA origami. They use DNA not the way you hear about it in all the TV shows, where it's the matching base pairs and information and content, but as a structural building material. We actually know that DNA is a molecular spring. We know exactly its material properties. We know how it bends. We know every sequence in it. And what, what they can do now is imagine a circle of DNA, which you can get very cheaply. They're called plasmids. You know every nucleotide. You know complementary sequences that would bind them and make a double helix. And so what they do is they take a big circle, and then they have a short little staple strand that is complementary to here and complementary to here. But because it's short, it pinches into a figure eight. And then they add another one and it pinches again. And imagine doing 10,000 simultaneously, and this whole thing folds up like a balloon animal. And you basically can make any shape you want. And we have CAD CAM, Computer Assisted Design Manufacturing Software, on the VIS website you could access that says, I want to make this shape. One grad student did a, a Trojan horse with a wagging tail. And the DNA folds up in the areas that are thinner and thicker. And you actually get that structure on the 100 nanometer scale. William did this with DNAs and built this uh, geodesic, oops, sorry, geodesic structure. And here, uh, this doesn't work, but this structure is an electron micrograph through it. This is essentially an artificial viral structure, which we're now exploring as a drug delivery system because viruses get into our cells more efficiently than any drug delivery system that we have. Now, having this ability to engineer on the nanoscale, which is the same scale that nature builds on, brings us back to design principles of how does nature build. And I've been interested for 30 years in how living cells are constructed. Most people think of cells as water balloons, a stretchy membrane around a viscous, goopy cytosol. Um, but it's very difficult to explain how our bodies, with the strength of muscles, for example, can, can be built this way. And so 25 years ago, I suggested that rather than being built like water balloons, that cells are built more like tents. The way you want to stabilize a tent is you take a flexible membrane, you put out 10 poles, and you put in 10 pegs, and you winch it in, and you put it under tension, isometric tension, or pre-stress, and you stabilize it. Now, this came out of the, the discovery, literally, when I was a grad student in the 70s, that all cells have a molecular skeleton or framework. And, but I suggest that you, cells use a very particular form of architecture to stabilize this that comes out of the Buckminster Fuller world of geodesic architecture, and it's known as tensegrity. Now, uh, this is how geodesic domes get their incredible efficiency, but this is the simple toy is the simplest way to think of it. Uh, some of you have, may have kids with the toy. This, these are black sticks that do not touch. 
They're held open because they're connected with a continuous series of red elastic filaments here. Now, without the sticks, the elastic filaments would lie on the table, and if I pushed it with a stick, it would be like a spider web cut from trees, no stability. But when you put them together and they are balance each other's forces, now you have a, a structure that holds its shape, in this case, a sphere. Now, I started to use this as a model of cells because when cells are not anchored, they're round. If you let them attach to a rigid foundation like the podium, they spread and flatten. And if you clip their anchors, they bounce up just like that. And the reason that I'm here today in terms of serendipity is that I did that, I, I saw that for the first time when I was an undergraduate at Yale in a sculpture class that I just happened to take the same week I learned to culture cells. And that, as they say, was the beginning of the rest of my life. So to come back to this, um, so we've shown now uh, that this is in fact the way cells are built. It also applies to our bodies with bones and muscles and tone or isometric tension determining the stiffness in your body, organs, molecules at all size scale. It's a fundamental design principle. The cytoskeleton is a great example of nature's nanotechnology, how it weaves molecules into cables and struts and ropes and then winches them in. But now with, with this DNA technology, we actually recently took the DNA origami and we built a tensegrity just like this this is a picture of a stick and string model that was, I built in my sculpture class in 1975. That's my first 10 segment I ever built. And we built this now out of one DNA that basically goes, it forms a helix, another helix joins together, six of them make a stiff strut, single one, then six, and then single one, and then the whole thing. As the struts grow out, it pre-stresses the whole thing. And these, this is just the beginning, but now when you bind something, you can change the mechanics. It can change its shape. And this is how nature basically, if, evolve life by building self-assembling materials that have mechanochemical properties. But what's interesting is the same design principle, without my involvement, has been imp having impact on other parts of the VEAS. We have a bio-inspired robotics platform. Rob Wood, Radhika Nagpal lead. Rob builds flying insect robots the size of your fingertip. And this is flying, lifting off at least. They use tensegrity to minimize weight. Uh, Joanna Eisenberg leads an adaptive architecture program uh, she won the Nikon Photography Award this year for one of these pictures. These little, little hairs are nanometer size hairs cut out, of, engineered out of silicon, but they're filled, they're in a, a, a sea of flexible polymer, which when it tenses makes them move different ways, just it's tensegrity. And this actually can grab like cilia in our lungs to clear things, or it can change how light passes through and color, potentially harness energy. And then to end, we have our last platform is called Biomaterials Evolution, which is to use whole genome engineering and directed evolution to create manufacturing plants and living cellular devices. The idea is to evolve materials rather than synthesize them. Stochasticity is noise, is variability. If we didn't have variability, we would not be here. Variability is the essence of evolution. You have to have variability to have natural selection. If everything were the same, it wouldn't happen. So, we do this with materials where we create every possible material and select out for whatever we want and then re reiterate. George Church developed a device called automated, uh, multiplexed automated genome engineering. We actually have this at the Wyss Institute now. And what this does is it takes a bacterium that is a manufacturing plant. You know, they use it for insulin, for example, or various chemicals at DuPont. And they can, in the past, they changed one, they inserted one gene and got it to express. And then by hand, sometimes they try to change other genes in the pathway to increase efficiency. And at DuPont, it took seven years and a half, $400 million to change 27 genes in one pathway. And that was profitable because that chemical, actually, they sell enough of it each year at, at, at low cost that it paid for itself. This device changed 24 genes in one pathway for a, chemical, a small chemical in three days. And this device does eight of them simultaneously. So uh, what... I hope, invite you to do is to come to the VEAS website. I want to time this to an exact second here. I have 40 seconds, 39, 38. Um, but what I hope you see is that there may be hope out there that, that we can do things we never thought we could do before, that innovation requires its own noise in terms of bringing people together. As someone said earlier, the, the, the labs that made major leaps had people from different disciplines looking at different perspectives. And that open mind for serendipity really comes from not being so focused in that you really think you know what you're looking for. And with that, I will end. Thank you so much. <laughs>